Boy, 20 years sounds like a long time, doesn't it? Uh, over 20 years ago, I came into contact with the first person that I didn't know it then, but I know it now. She was trafficked. She was a 12-year-old adolescent that was in my physical custody. And her trafficker was her mother. Her mother turned her out or prostituted her. And when folks think about prostitution, they usually have a very different picture. But she was turned out at eight years old, and her street corner was actually her home in her neighborhood. So at that time, I didn't know what it was or what it was called. I just knew that it really moved me to do something to make this not happen to another child. To define human trafficking, a lot of folks have a very specific picture of what this looks like and what it is, but it's much broader than that. And basically, human trafficking is goods or labor or something of value that's elicited through fraud, force, or coercion. So, and sometimes folks get confused because they think that there has to be a trafficking component that somebody has to be moved, and that's not the case. Sometimes folks also get confused and think smuggling is part of this. Smuggling is a crime against a border. Trafficking is a crime against a human. Now, what we know about trafficking, it is very, very pervasive, and it is a huge problem. What we know is that the Federal Bureau of Investigation has it as one of their highest priorities. The Civil Rights Division considers it their one, number one priority. The uh, Criminal Investigation Unit, the one that we more typically think of when we are thinking of FBI, actually has it as their number two priority right behind drug commerce, and it's actually expected to overtake that. So this is how big an issue it is. A lot of us, unknowingly benefit from the enslavement of others. And this doesn't necessarily mean folks that are in, buying people through prostitution or you know, taking part of certain forms of pornography. This is all of us. Uh, the food that we consume, the uh, technology we carry in our pockets, and maybe the batteries that power that technology. Some of you probably have it in your pocket right now. The clothes that we're wearing on our backs or the textiles we buy. More than likely, everyone in this room has been in the presence of someone who has been trafficked or enslaved. If you are going anywhere where folks are working in the service industry, food, or entertainment venues, or vacation spots, or you know, low-cost spa or personal care services. One thing to consider is if something is disproportionately inexpensive, somebody paid. Somebody paid with their relationships, with their happiness, with a lot of things, their childhood, and potentially their lives. How does this happen? People ask this often. The answer is money is a big part of it. When you think about human trafficking, 150 billion with a B dollars, that's how much is made annually from human trafficking. Now we know that 15,000 folks are trafficked into the United States and 100,000 to 300,000 folks are trafficked within the United States, so usually minor girls for commercial sexual exploitation. We know that 83% of people that are, human traffic, that are human trafficking victims are here legally or citizens. So this is a big issue. And there's several things that also drive this besides greed and money. The traffickers are very good at grooming everyone around the victim and the victim themselves. They make the person feel like, or the people around them, identify them as less than, less than human, less than deserving, less than you know, warranting human respect. They seek people who are vulnerable 
And when you think about who's vulnerable, think about generational poverty, think about food insecurity, but we also, when we think about vulnerability, we think about children. And all children are vulnerable to some degree, and vulnerability is in the eye of the perpetrator. So this is not a victim blaming statement. It's they will seek out what vulnerability they can. At risk kids, kids that are in the uh, foster care system, they will look for folks that are undocumented. They'll look for folks that maybe nobody will look for them or don't ha their families don't have the resources to find them. And we also have to realize that our culture plays a huge role in this piece, that we live in unfortunately in a culture that has overt and covert oppression. And when you think about some of the messages that are sent out through our popular culture, through our popular media, you're seeing messages that include, you know, things that have misogyny, that have uh, different types of invalidation of certain populations. You're seeing a lot of isms, whether it be sexism, racism, other pieces. And you're seeing, you know, again, this message of some people are not worthy. I disagree with that. So what can we do? Because this seems like a big problem. And sometimes it's easy to think, doesn't matter what I do, it's just a drop in the bucket. It's never going to make a difference. We can make a difference because each effort that we make is like a drop in a pond. And that ripple effect can spread out and move forward. What we really have to do is think about challenging ourselves and challenging others to be not only interventionists or bystanders, but to be interventionist. There's two ways we're going to fight this on the ground, and that's by intervening and by prevention. So when I talk about being an interventionist, sometimes folks think that I'm urging them to jump into these situations, you know, full on, full frontal. No, that is not what I'm suggesting. What I am suggesting is, is everybody can do something. Not everyone can do everything, but everyone can do something. And it may be something as simple as looking at your consumerism and seeing one change that you can make and then making that change and making it a habit. And then when you've made it a habit, choose something else and make that a habit. Lather, rinse, repeat. The other things that we can do is educating ourselves to challenge these societal constructs that allow us to not really think about where these attitudes are coming from or why we think what we think. A lot of that is acknowledging our individual privilege. And sometimes people kind of bristle at the word privilege, but basically what I'll su uh, suggest to you is take a look at things that you don't consider to be a problem for you because more than likely they are a problem for someone else, like human trafficking. We also need to realize that sometimes everything that we think, we don't necessarily need to believe. <laughs> so when we're talking about you know, changing our perception, we really need to look at ourselves and challenge ourselves to, you know, to really confront these uh, societal norms that are promulgated via our media that are really harmful. But when we suspect something, we also need to be able to take action. And that may mean making a phone call after the fact. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do something right at that moment because it may not be safe because your safety is paramount. But everyone can do something. When you take one step, it makes another step much easier. And if we all take responsibility to do something, think about the impact that we could have, not only here, but worldwide. So I have a call to action. And that call to action is, is to think about the ways that you can make some of the changes that we talked about and educating yourself on that. Also, confronting and challenging some of your beliefs that may or may not play into this, and also being comfortable and willing to challenge those beliefs and those acts and those statements from others that provide this foundation 
for this inequality to grow from. And with that piece, we also need to realize that our relationships, sometimes technology has been a huge gift, and sometimes it's been a challenge. And sometimes it can be a little isolating. And sometimes we have a lack of connection that you know, invalidates the experiences. Like the young woman that I spoke to you of when I first came out here, she came into my custody because she was adjudicated delinquent and she had been picked up for prostitution. Her behavior had been criminalized even though she was a sexually abused child. We also a lot of times focus very much on the behavior of the victim and victim blame instead of focusing on holding the counter accountable, the perpetrator accountable. So that would be something that I would challenge folks to think about. The other piece is, you know, research what your local resources are or how you can, you know, get assistance. If you have a local human trafficking task force like we do in this area, those types of things that you need to know before you're presented with something. So when something happens, you're not searching for what to do in the heat of the moment. We can all make a difference. We can. And sometimes folks say to me, what if I'm wrong? My question is, what if you're right? Dr. Maya Angelou stated, until you know, but you know, do better once you know better, paraphrasing her very loosely. So once you know differently or you know better, then you're prepared to do something differently. That is what I challenge everyone to do tonight. Thank you.